Pastor Ville and welcome back. So now we are, we began the transition process last week looking at uh, well, the closing part of the White Lotus book, but also looking at some things related to how to do deity practice, deity yoga practice, from the view of Dzogchen. <clears throat> and so that's going to be more of our theme as we go through here. And so we are doing this through the Treasure Meditation book. And so within this, there it's focused on the four roots. And so the four roots are the Guru, Yeram, Dikini, and Protector. And so in here, the Guru is represented by Guru Rinpoche. And so Pava Sambhava. And there are some opening prayers in the first part, which are not necessarily related specifically to Guru Yoga, uh, that it goes through. So there's an opening mantra there, the blessing mantra. So we receive the blessing of all the Buddhas, and then everything that happens thereafter is extra special. And then there's a refuge and bodhicitta prayer. Then there's the four immeasurables, then there's the seven line prayer, and the seven limb prayer, the nature of phenomena prayer, and then we get to the actual practice, the Rigpa Guru Yoga. <clears throat> so this text in and of itself is a Dzogchen version of the deity practice, where Baba Sabhava is the, the deity, if you will. And so we'll, we'll take a detailed look at that. But before we do, I wanted to first talk a little bit about Padmasambhava. What do we know about Padmasambhava uh, based on the research that's been done, based on books that have been published and, and so forth as a part of that? <clears throat> so I wanted to start with just some general information from Guru Google, <laughs> in this case Wikipedia, Guru Wikipedia, um, because it has some pretty good information you know, from, from various sources. Wikipedia over the years has gotten much better in terms of the quality and, and amount of content available here. So the description here is that he was an 8th century Buddhist master from the Indian subcontinent. Although there was a historical Padmasambhava, little is known about him apart from helping the construction of the first Buddhist monastery in Tibet at Samye, at the behest of Trisong Detson, who was the king, and shortly thereafter leaving Tibet due to, says, court intrigues. Uh, different definitions or different explanations for what that might mean. So there are a number of legends that have grown around Pavasambhava's life and deeds, and he is widely venerated as the second Buddha by adherents of Tibetan Buddhism in Tibet and, and other areas around the Himalayas. He is a character of a genre of literature called Terma. Uh, terma is a hidden treasure text of some kind. Uh, well, can be Termas can actually be other things than just texts, but that's what we're referring to here a genre of literature. An emanation of Amitabha that is said to appear to Tertans. The Tertans would be the ones who find these hidden treasures. In visionary encounters and a focus of Guru Yoga practice. The Nyingma school considers Padmasambhava to have to be a founder of their tradition. And so Buddhism existed in Tibet prior to Padmasambhava and King Trisong Detson trying to bring it in and strengthen it, build the first monastery and so forth. Um, but it apparently wasn't real strong yet at that point. And for reasons we have no idea about, uh, the king, Trisan Detson, decided that he wanted to expand that. And so he began that process. So the story goes on then. One of the earliest sources for Padmasambhava as a historical figure is the Testament of Ba, B-A, dating to the 9th or 10th centuries, which records the foundation, the founding of Samaya, Samye Monastery under King Trisan Detson. Other texts from uh, Dunhuang, that's where that particular text was also found, that Testament of Ba. 
But there were some other ones related to Padmasambhava. And so some of them show that Padmasambhava's tantric teachings were being taught in Tibet during the 10th century. It doesn't link it back to his time, so it's a couple hundred years after him. New evidence suggests that Padmasambhava already figured in religious myth and ritual and was probably even seen as the enlightened source of tantric scriptures. As many as 200 years before, Nyangrel Nina Ozer, Nyanga, Nyangrel Nima Ozer, who lived in the 1100s to 1200s, about the same time as Long Chempa, okay? uh, a little bit later. And uh, this person, Nangyo Nima Odzer, uh, is the main subject of this book, Remembering the Lotus Born. And the reason is that he was the first Turtan finding something about Pabasambhava and then publicizing that in many ways. And that became kind of the standard view of Padmasambhava, and it goes on to tell a little bit about that in here. Uh, I'll read a little bit out of this book as well, uh, but most of it is actually focused on the Turtan, not Padmasambhava per se. So um, if you're interested in learning a little bit about that tradition, that's a good resource. The principal architect of Padmasambhava mythos. So in the 11th and 12th centuries, there were several competing terma traditions. At the end of the 12th century, there was the victory of Padmasambhava cult, in which a much greater role was assigned to Padmasambhava in the introduction of Buddhism to Tibet. So that's something that there really wasn't any evidence of anything going on for a couple hundred years, and all of a sudden this pops up. And then you get a couple of different groups competing with each other to talk about what actually happened. And one of those eventually kind of won out in that process. So according to tradition, Padmasambhava was incarnated as an eight-year-old child appearing in a lotus blossom floating on Lake Danakosha in the kingdom of Odiana. While some scholars locate this kingdom in Swat Valley area of modern Pakistan, a case on literary, archaeological, and iconographical sorry, grounds can be made for placing it in present-day state of Odisha in India. And Odisha, uh, you may know where Bengal, West Bengal is, which is on the eastern side along the coast and then down be kind of uh, southwest of there a little ways. Well, Odisha is southwest of Bengal, so it's further down a little bit. Padmasambhava's special nature was recognized by the childless local king of Odiana and was chosen to take over the kingdom, but he left Odiana for northern parts of India. Um, there are, interestingly, as well, very interesting parallels between the story of the life, the birth and life of Padmasambhava to Shakyamuni Buddha. A lot of very, very similar aspects of that. The, the details, not quite so much, but the general outline is very similar. And then in Rewalsar, known as Tsopema in Tibetan, he secretly taught tantric teachings to Princess Mandarava, the local king's daughter. The king found out and tried to burn him. But it is believed that when the smoke cleared, he just sat there, still alive and in meditation. Greatly astonished this, by this miracle, the king offered Pavasubhava both his kingdom and Mandarava. So Padmasambhava left with Mandarava and took uh, Maratika Cave in Nepal to practice secret tantic consort rituals. They had a vision of Buddha Amitayu and achieved rainbow body. Both Padmasambhava and Mandarava are still believed to be alive and active in this rainbow body form by their followers. She and Padmasambhava's other main consort, Yeshe Tsogyal, who reputedly hid this nu his numerous termas in Tibet for later discovery, reached Buddhahood, and then many tankas and paintings show Padmasambhava in between them, with Mandarava on his right and Yeshe Tsogyal 
on his left. Now, according to earlier histories, Padmasambhava had given some tantric teachings to Tibetan before, he, before being forced to leave due to the suspicions of the Tibetan court. That's that intrigue we mentioned a little bit earlier. But from the 12th century, an alternative story, itself a term of discovery, gave Padmasambhava a much greater role in the introduction of Buddhism to Tibet, and in particular credited him with traveling all over the country to convert the local spirits to Buddhism. So there's, there's basically two stories. There's a here I am, goodbye, I'm out of here, and then there's another story that he came and then he wandered around and hit all these termas and, and converted all of these spirits, a little bit like St. Patrick in Ireland and so forth, uh, converting the Celtic, Celtic uh, uh, spirits to be saints in the Catholic tradition. So it's a little bit like that. According to this enlarged story, King Trisan Detson, the 38th king of the Yarlung dynasty and the first emperor of Tibet, late 700s, invited Nalanda University abbot Shantarakshita to Tibet. Shantarakshita started the building of Samye. Demonical forces hindered the introduction of the Buddhist Dharma, and Pamasambhava was invited to Tibet to subdue the demonic forces. The demons were not annihilated, but were obliged to submit to the Dharma. This was in accordance with the tantric principle of not eliminating negative forces, but redirecting them. Uh, to fuel the journey towards spiritual awakening. According to tradition, Pamasambhava received one of the emperor's uh, wives, the Dakini Yeshe Tsogyal, as a consort. And then, uh, in terms of Nyingma, he is regarded as the founder of the Nyingma tradition. Nyingma literally means ancient and is often referred to as the early translation school because it is founded on the first translations of Buddhist scriptures from Sanskrit into Tibetan in the 8th century. Now, there were uh, considerably before that some translations of texts in, in the uh, first part of when Buddhism came into Tibet. And so this wasn't really the first, but it was another part of what was going on at this time. The group particularly believes in hidden term of treasures. Traditionally, practice was advanced orally among those among a loose network of lay practitioners. Monasteries and the practice of reincarnated spiritual leaders are later adaptations. In modern times, Nyingma lineage has been centered in the Kham district in eastern Tibet. And Bhutan has also many important pilgrimage places associated with Padmasambhava, the most famous being the Tiger's Nest Monastery, built on the sheer cliff wall about 900 meters above the floor of Paro Valley. It was built around a cave where he, Padmasambhava, is said to have meditated in the 8th century. He flew there from Tibet on the back of Yeshe Tsogyal, whom he, he transformed into a flying tigress for the purpose of the trip. According to legend, Padmasambhava's body imprint can be found in the wall of a cave nearby. And then it goes through a detail which I won't talk about here, detailed description of him and the, the iconography associated with him. It's a couple pages long. You can look that up if you're interested. And then it talks about eight manifestations. One of the uh, popular and uh, uh, common senses of uh, lore about Padmasambhava is that he took eight different forms or manifestations. And so Padmasambhava uh, represented different aspects. These represent different aspects of his being. Okay, so it's not like it's just him, but they are manifestations of him in different forms. Such as wrath or pacification, for example, the eight principal forms were assumed at different points in his life. Excuse me, the eight manifestations of Padmasambhava belong to the tradition of the revealed treasure. So these are a little bit like uh, Takaka, uh, to Jakarta tales of uh, the Buddha. 
And so just very, very briefly, this doesn't give much detail, but just so you have a sense of who they were. Uh, the first one is Guru Udiana Vajradhara. He just says that he's depicted in, in union with his consort. And then there is Guru Sakya Simha in Bodhgaya, who learns the tantric practices. Guru uh, Padmaraja of Udhyana. And Guru Padmakara, who teaches Dharma. Um, Guru Mativat Vararuchi of Kashmir. Uh, meaning the intelligent youth who gathers the knowledge of all worlds. Guru Suryabhasha, uh, the sunray yogi who illuminates the darkness of the mind through, a, a, through Dzogchen and uh, dressed as a naked yogi. And then the uh, Guru Dorje Drolo, the fierce manifestation of Vajrakalaya, a uh, wrathful form of Vajrasattva, the comforter of all, imprinting the elements with wisdom treasure. And then the last one, the eighth one, is Guru Simhanada of Nalanda University, the lion of debate, promulgator of the Dharma throughout the six realms of sentient beings, shown in a very fierce form, imitative of Vajrapani. So he looks a lot like Vajrapani, if you know what that looks like. And of course, his pure land is the copper colored mountain. They included here one quote from Padmasambhava out of a plethora of quotes that are available from the various sources. It says, but this is, a, is an interesting one. My father is the intrinsic awareness, Samatabhadra. My mother is the ultimate sphere of reality, Samatabhadri. I belong to the caste of non-duality by of the sphere of awareness. My name is the glorious lotus born. I am from the unborn sphere of all phenomena. I act in the way of the Buddhas of the three times. So it kind of brings him together in the context of these uh, broader principles within Tibetan Buddhism. And then it talks a little bit about the mantra the Padmasambhava mantra, Om Ah Hong Vajra Guru Padma Siddhi Hong. Or in Tibetan, it's generally Om Ah Hong Benza Guru Pema Siddhi Hong. A slight difference there. It is held to be a powerful mantra, engendering communion with the three Vajras of Padmasambhava's mind stream and all enlightened beings. And then there's the seven line prayer, which we spent quite a bit of time looking at as well. Um, the seven line prayer to Padmasambhava is a famous prayer that is recited by many Tibetans daily and is said to contain most sacred and important teachings of Dzogchen. And so we saw in the interpretation or the, the commentary by Mipam Rinpoche, that was one of the five that that he used to explain that, or perhaps two with the fourth columns uh, also, or the, the fifth columns also considered to be a Dzogchen view, which is very similar in that nature. So anyway, Ju Mipam composed a famous commentary called White Lotus. It explains the meanings embedded in many levels and intended to catalyze realization. These hidden teachings are described as ripening and deepening with study and contemplation. So the more we read it, study it, go into these, the better we understand it, the deeper we are able to understand it as well. Then it talks a little bit about the termas that have been alluded to a little bit here. Padmasambhava is also said to have hidden a number of religious treasures or termas in lakes, caves, fields, forests of the Himalayan region to be found and interpreted by future tertans or spiritual treasure finders or revealers sometimes. Um, and so one example it lists here is Bardo Todal or the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, was one of those discovered by Karma Lingpa, although some people think it may have been written by him because there are some things that Padmasambhava wouldn't have known about at the time he is supposed to have read or uh, written uh, that and buried it away. 
Um, uh, Karmalinka is also associated with natural liberation. And another book on the six uh, bardo teachings of Padmasambhava. And the one that forms the root of the text uh, in our book, Innate Happiness, in terms of the, the teachings, is organized a little differently. But it's, um, a lot of that is based on that particular set of teachings of Padmasambhava. And then the tantric cycles are related to Padmasambhava that are related to him are not just practiced by the Nyingma. They even gave rise to a new offshoot of Bon, which emerged in the 14th century called the New Bon. And prominent figures of the Sarma, new translation schools, such as the Karmapas and Sakya lineage heads who have practiced these cycles and taught them. Uh, even the Dalai Lama has, has taught some of these things. The Hidden Lake Temple of the Dalai Lamas, which is behind the Putala, is called Lukang, is dedicated to Dzogchen and has murals depicting the eight manifestations of Padmasambhava. There's a book out that has taken pictures of all of the things in there and gives a brief explanation of the content of those as well. Very interesting. So then, as we mentioned before, he is said to have had a number of different consorts. So many of those who were gathered around Padmasambhava became advanced tantric practitioners as well as helping to found and propagate Nyingma tradition. The most prominent include Padmasambhava's five main female consorts, also known as Dakinis, as well as his 25 main disciples. So Padmasambhava had five main female tantric companions beginning in India before his time in Tibet and then in Tibet as well. That the women come from different geographic regions is understood as a mandala, a support for Padmasambhava in spreading the Dharma throughout the region. Understood from a more inner tantric perspective, these women are understood as Dakinis. Each of these consorts is believed to be an emanation of Vajravarahi. And then the body emanation is Mandarava, the speech emanation Yeshitsogya, the mind emanation Shakyadema, the qualities emanation Kalasiddhi, the uh, activity emanation Trashi Chidrin. So those are the five main uh, Dakinis associated with his life. Only two of them are there very much information about. Uh, Mandarava and Yeshit Sogyal, uh, very little information about any of the others. And then there's the 25 disciples as well, or the, the 25 main disciples. <laughs> so he had other, other followers as well. And so these are called the disciples of Chimpu. And there are various lists, so the lists don't agree on who they are. So we don't know for sure exactly who those 25 are, but there are some names you're probably familiar with. King Trisong Detson was one of them, and Yeshe Tsogyal was another. Sangha Yeshe is, is one, and um, our own uh, spiritual director is said to be a, an incarnation of him. And then Veritsana, the translator, probably familiar with him. Oh, I was going to mention, uh, Sangha Yeshe is also associated with um, creating, during the time of Langdharma, who was the, the king that supposedly destroyed, or tried to destroy Buddhism in Tibet, um, but not completely, mostly just the monasteries in the mona uh, monastic tradition. But he manifested, in according to tradition, this, this huge scorpion in the sky and scared the king so much that he kind of backed off and said, okay, you can practice at home, but you can't do monasteries. <laughs> anyway, uh, and finally, the Malamitra is another one that is a part of that clan. And there are actually quite a few books that are available. And um, in addition to Remembering the Lotus Born, which is a more scholarly kind of a book uh, about primarily the Termit tradition and how that came about, but in a part of it is that he looks at these different traditions in terms of what little historical information is available to try and ascertain the extent to which some of those may be valid or not. 
Some he finds to have potential validity, some he finds not to have that validity. So a scholarly look. Um, as you know, I have a scholarly background, so I'm always interested in those things, uh, even though I don't use that to make my decisions about my practice. So another one uh, is supposedly recorded by Yeshet Sogal, The Lotus Born, biography about him. Uh, another one is Advice from the Lotus Born, which is also a collection of various texts from giving teachings to Yeshet Sogal. Uh, this one's kind of interesting, uh, a translation of the essential instructions mastering the energies of life, secret teachings of Padmasambhava. So a, a nice small book. And one that I like a great deal, has a lot of really interesting, useful information called Treasures from Juniper Ridge, the profound treasure in instructions of Padmasambhava to the Dakini Yeshitsogyal. So according to at least the, the theory, the stories, the legend, whatever you want to call it, uh, Padmasambhava gave lots of teachings, but he didn't write much. <laughs> but Yeshe Sogel apparently would write these things down, and according to legend, he or she, rather for the most part, or sometimes they together, would bury these things as hidden treasures to be found later at a time that was appropriate for the, the actual text to arise. And very controversial among Tibetan Buddhism, whether or not that is a valid uh, form of sources or not. Um, but in the Nyingma tradition, very, very highly regarded as a part of that. And also, I would argue, is a significant factor in helping to keep the tradition alive. Because as great masters come along, and either they or other people they know find some of these hidden treasures and expand upon them, they allow the tradition to continue, to adapt, and so forth, uh, to meet the needs of people, which is what it's all about. And so I think in many ways that is a good thing. So then let's get a little bit more down to the details here of what we wanted to look at today. Uh, but before we do that, maybe let's take a short break and then we'll come back and we'll focus on that. <laughs> 